Okay, so first, before we talk about program theories and logic models, I want to briefly talk about this idea of reproducibility, um, and especially this idea of reproducible research. Um, and it answers this question here of why I am making you learn R. Um, several of you have uh, run into lots of problems learning R initially. Um, you've all struggled through the first couple problem sets, and that's great. That's how you learn. It is kind of a miserable process at the beginning, but eventually you will catch on, and I promise you will get this. Um, but there's a good reason, there's a whole bunch of good reasons I'm making you do this um, versus just doing this in Stata or Excel. Um, first of all, R is more powerful than Excel. Um, so far, the stuff that you've done, um, showing a chart of uh, miles per gallon, um, you can do that in Excel. Or um, showing a scatter plot of penguin characteristics, you can probably do that in Excel too. Um, but running regression models, um, that's really hard to do in Excel. Um, you can do that with Stata or SPSS. Um, they're statistical programming languages that's, or programs. That's what you're supposed to do with them. Um, and that's fine. In your previous stats classes, that's what you used, is Stata or SPSS or maybe SAS or something else similar to that. Um, but R also lets you do this stuff. Um, it's more powerful than kind of a standard Excel sheet. Um, another reason why I have you do this um, versus Stata or SPSS is that R is free and open source, which means when you are done with this program, you will still have access to R. Um, if you have a Stata student license, as soon as you graduate, that disappears. Um, Stata licenses only last for a certain number of months, even if you are a student. And so um, some of you might have a Stata license that has expired, but you're still in the program and you have to pay to get it extended and it, it's a mess. Um, and so my philosophy for this um, kind of parallels DJ Patil. If you remember the video you watched in the very first week, um, his philosophy was that no technology can be radical and universal unless anybody can use it um, and everybody can use it. And so if you learn cool things in Stata, um, how to do diff and diff analysis or regression discontinuity, that's neat, but you're not going to be able to do that after you graduate unless you have access to Stata. And so giving you these tools so that you can continue to use them after you're done with this program um, is kind of a way of making sure the rest of the world still has access to these revolutionary, cool, new data scientific tools. Um, the main reason, though, that we're going to talk about right now is this idea of reproducibility. Um, the really neat thing about using our markdown and all of the like writing out all of the code that you've been doing and mixing it in with your text um, is that that is basically a record of everything that you did to generate your analysis. Um, in real life, if you have like a report, most people aren't going to see the code and there's a way in our markdown to turn off the code so that nobody actually sees that, but you'll, st you'll still see the graphics and the tables and other things that get generated by the code. Um, and if you share that R markdown file with people, they can walk through that same process of everything you did to generate all of your results. And this is important because other programs don't let you do this. And I'm guessing most of you in your past stats classes did not have a heavy focus on reproducibility. Um, you generated your results, you ran regressions by clicking on menus, you'd see a table, um, Stata has a way of exporting a table as a Word file, and then you can copy that table from that Word file into your main Word file. If you have to update anything or rerun a model or change one of the variables, then you have to go and do that in Stata again, export it as a Word file, take it out of that Word file, put it in yours, um, if you mentioned any numbers in your text, um, then you have to go through and read it and make sure you update those numbers and you might miss some and that's just the way of writing about stats and it's kind of miserable. Um, and you can make mistakes and those mistakes can lead to uh, potentially very large consequences for policy. Um, most of the stuff you're doing probably won't have massive ramifications for global policy, but it might. For instance, here's this fun paper um, by two economists, uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff, um, that they wrote in 2010. This was right around the time of the Great Recession uh, around the world. And what they did in this paper here, um, they used uh, statistical analysis to calculate kind of the, the debt to GDP ratio for a whole bunch of different countries. And so this is the total national debt of a country in comparison to the total GDP that it generates. And so what they found in this paper is that if that debt to GDP ratio is above 90%, meaning you have lots of debt in your country, 
um, then that leads to negative economic growth. And so as a result, their policy prescription from this paper was don't have massive levels of national debt. Um, and so as a result, lots of European countries um, like Greece and um, Ireland and Portugal and Spain started implementing austerity measures to cut back on the national debt levels that they had so that they could maintain a lower debt to GDP ratio. Because research had shown that if you have that low debt to GDP ratio, then you're going to um, grow better. If it's really high, if you're doing lots of public spending or lots of bailouts or lots of other things that kind of go against this idea of austerity, then that's going to lead to negative growth and you don't want that. Um, it even became popular in the United States. Um, in 2013, Paul Ryan, who was Speaker of the House then, um, this was part of the, the House of Representatives budget proposal for the United States. They cited the Reinhardt and Rogoff paper um, saying we need to have low debt to GDP, so let's cut a whole bunch of social programs so that we can lower that national debt and um, grow in the future. And so it was all based kind of on this, this paper here. Um, a fun thing happened with this paper, though. Um, this PhD student here, uh, a common thing to do for PhD students in stats classes, um, those of you in this class who are PhD students will probably run into this eventually, um, a final project for a stats class um, often consists of finding a paper that exists, out, that exists out in the world, asking the authors for their data, and then reproducing that paper. Um, it's useful because you can see how they ran all of their models, how they manipulated their data. You can see their whole process of research, and that's cool. Um, so this grad student did that um, on this paper. He wanted to see what was going on. He wanted to, to learn from the paper. So he emailed um, the authors who graciously allowed him to look at the data. Um, often, but the best practice in academic research, at least, is to make your data publicly available so that anybody can just download it so you don't have to beg the authors for stuff. Um, but they, this grad student begged them for, for their data. He got the data and he looked at it and he found some strange things. He found when he ran the analysis that that negative growth that comes um, from having high debt actually disappeared and was positive. And he couldn't figure out why until he looked at their analysis. Um, and what he found is this is the main table that they used to show um, a whole bunch of different countries, their different debt to GDP ratios over time. Um, and so what they did is they figured out the average and the median and different values here, um, different summary statistics. But what they did, or either the authors themselves or the research assistants, this was all based in Excel. And so when they calculated these different numbers, they dragged, they said like equals sum, and then they dragged, instead of starting at the top of the list, they started somewhere in the middle and then dragged all the way down. Um, or in their case, they didn't actually start in the middle. This table was flipped, so it started with the United States. So they dragged from the, the top down, but they didn't drag down all the way. And so as a result, their summary statistics were missing five rows. Um, which were fairly important rows. So once this grad student expanded Excel a little bit more so it covered all of the observations, he found that having a high debt to GDP ratio actually leads to substantial GDP growth, um, which is the exact opposite of what Reinhardt and Rogoff were saying. Um, so oops, Excel potentially helped cause austerity measures throughout Europe um, because they forgot to drag it all the way down. Um, R would not necessarily fix this, um, but it would be a lot more apparent with R if you were reading through the code and you said, oh, that's not quite the right measure, or that's missing some of the, some of the observations. It's more readily apparent instead of being, um, like if this is Excel, it's going to be buried in the formula cell and it's going to be really hard to see. Um, and so that's like bad. Um, we don't want to have kind of um, Excel-based research that has a whole bunch of hidden errors in it that we can't actually see. Um, economics is not the only thing that suffers from Excel-based problems. Genetics has some interesting um, phenomena happen to it because of Excel. Um, so these are three different genes um, in um, different human and other animal genomes here. Um, I know very little about genetics, I just know that these genes exist. So septin2 does something, this membrane-associated ring finger um, has this abbreviation C3HC4, 
And then there's this number, which is some index for um, one of the genes, and it has an E in it because they just use letters sometimes. Um, so what's fascinating is if you um, open an, or a data set of genetic data and it has cells like this in there, um, like abbreviations, um, this is abbreviated as SEPT2. This is abbreviated as MAR, um, or MAR34. Or, or one, or different MAR-based um, abbreviations. If you open this in Excel, Excel actually destroys your data. Um, so SEPT2, which stands for Septin2, Excel sees that and thinks it's a date, and so it switches it to a date. Um, this March 1st, this membrane-associated ring finger thing, turns that into March 1st. This ID number here, Excel turns that into a number, because it sees the E, and that is scientific notation for um, having lots and lots of um, zeros after it. And so Excel says, oh, that's 2.3 times 10 to the 19th power. So move the decimal point 19 places out that way. Um, and so Excel will destroy that data if you just open it in Excel. And if you accidentally save that sheet, then a bunch of your cells will switch from genes to dates or from genes to numbers. Um, which seems like a, a minimal problem, but there was a study that was done a few years ago that found that 20% of genetics papers that had been published between 2005 and 2015 used data that had dates in it um, because the researchers had opened their Excel file, accidentally saved it, and then they did their statistical analysis in SPSS or SAS or whatever based on this Excel file that had become corrupted because it turned a bunch of stuff into dates which is incredibly dangerous. Um, if you're doing like actual like medical research on genes, you're throwing away 20% of your data because it's suddenly switching to dates. Um, just in um, August 2020, um, the genetics world had been working with Excel to try to get them to stop changing their genes into dates. Um, but Excel like won't like Microsoft won't fix it. And so what the genetics world decided to do was change the abbreviations for all of the potentially date like genes. Um, and so now Septin2 no longer has SEPT2 as its abbreviation. It's something else that won't turn into a date. And so they've had to like redo their whole genetics data um, th for like the whole field of genetics so that Excel won't mess it up. Um, so that's like dangerous. Um, so the moral of this whole story here, um, as far as like analyzing data in general, is don't touch the raw data um, if you can help it. Um, so if you download a CSV file or an Excel file or some sort of file from a city database or from some state website, um, don't open that in Excel and start changing things around and adding columns and moving stuff around because you want your analysis to be as reproducible as possible. And you don't want to accidentally forget to drag uh, one of your columns down by five rows. Um, you don't want to open it in Excel and have it change some of your data into dates. Um, ideally, don't open it in Excel. Um, it can be helpful to open it in Excel to just kind of get a feel for what's in the data. But if you do, don't save it. Um, just in case it messes anything up. Um, so keep the raw data as pristine as possible. And then load that directly into R, and then you can explore in R. You can add new columns, filter, group by summarize, do everything else in R. And the nice thing about doing it there is that it is fully self-documented. Um, so anybody can go through your code and see what you did to that raw data to manipulate it into the data that you used on your models. Um, which is great because now anybody can follow your same process. Um, and doing this all in R Markdown ensures that um, kind of the code and the text and the results are all in the same document. Anybody can follow the whole process. Um, you can use the text to explain, I went to this website, went to this page on the website, clicked on this button, downloaded this Excel file, and this is how I loaded it, and then this is what I did to the Excel files. So you can be super verbose explaining everything that you did, all of the decisions you made to collapse different categories or to add new columns. Um, you can explain all of that directly in the text, and then anybody can read it and reproduce what you do. Um, the third thing here is to, in general, use open formats, um, meaning um, 
file formats that anybody can open, even if they don't have Excel on their computer. Um, Excel files, these .xlsx files, are fairly universal. Most people have Excel on their computer, but not everybody. It costs money. Um, and so if you're sharing data as an Excel file, that is limiting lots of people's access to your data. Um, CSV files are essentially Excel files. Um, they're spreadsheets. They just don't have the ability to highlight um, cells or do fancy formatting or other like fancy Excel tricks. You can't embed a chart in a CSV file. A CSV file is really just kind of the data in the columns and the rows. Um, but if you're sharing data, that is the ideal way to do it. Um, because anybody can open a CSV file. You don't have to have Excel to do that. You can use any program. Even a text editor will show you the data inside a CSV file. So if you can make everything kind of as open as possible um, and use CSV files, um, make all of your analysis self-documenting and reproducible, and don't touch the raw data if you can. Um, if you can avoid it, great. Um, that's going to be kind of the best process for doing this kind of analysis. Um, and you won't accidentally cause austerity measures in Europe um, during a recession. Um, as far as our markdown in real life, um, lots of companies and lots of organizations use this stuff. Um, I'm not trying to torture you with it. Um, this is like general best practices here. So Airbnb a few years ago published a paper explaining their whole data science workflow internally. Um, and in their paper, if you click on this link right here, it'll take you to that paper. Um, they say that they use ggplot to visualize data, which is why I'm teaching you that, because it's kind of industry standard. But then they also say that all of their analyses are documented in R Markdown, where code and visualizations are combined in a single written report. So all of the internal data science reports that happen in these kinds of companies are just R Markdown files that they knit, and then they email the HTML files or the PDFs or the Word files around the office. People can read them comment on them, but everything's kind of based on our markdown, um, which is cool. It's not just the private sector. Um, the UK does the same thing. A few years ago, they switched from this process here, which is what you all learn in your stats classes, um, where you have some data set, you open a statistical program and do stuff with it, you export the results into a spreadsheet, um, like regression results can go into an exported Excel sheet. You open that Excel sheet, you copy it, you paste it into Word, and then when you're all done, you can change the, the Word version into a PDF, and that's your final published version. Um, and so this is kind of the standard way of doing um, stats, which is how you learn in your stats classes. The issue is you can make mistakes here or here or here. Um, if anything changes back here, you have to make sure you make changes at every step of the process up to the very final product, and that is hard to do. Um, and so what they do in the UK is they use our markdown, um, which draws directly, they have data sets um, that they either download from different government agencies, or I think they have like an SQL database that they can connect to and pull the data from that. They do all of the analysis and everything directly in the R Markdown file. They knit to PDF and then stick that on um, one of the gov.uk websites and people can download PDFs um, of the UK's statistical analysis. Um, the nice thing about this is if the data ever changes, they just click on knit and they get a new version of the report. They don't need to make sure that they copy and paste all of the exact numbers back from what it like from the new version, make sure everything is, is replaced. It just happens in the document by itself, um, which is super magical, super reproducible, kind of best practice. Um, and so that is why I am teaching you to do this. Um, it is a little bit more upfront work. Um, it's another thing to learn. Um, but once you learn it, it will make your life a lot simpler and you'll fit in with other government agencies doing this and private companies doing this. And this is kind of the best practice way of, of recording all of your analyses in one document. Um, so do that, avoid Excel as much as possible, and make sure everything is reproducible.